So Esther gives us some historical accounts um, and is in that classification of scripture. And one of the things that's interesting to me about the book of Esther, and this is kind of like a, almost a fallacy. They say that God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. That's like the, the word on the street, is that God is never mentioned. Right. But as you read and think about the Lord, and you think about sovereignty, providence, and his presence, does God need to be speaking directly and thus saith the Lord, thus and so, for him to be present in the book of Esther? No. Absolutely not. And so, for me, I think this is something that when we hear people say it, we should push back against that a little bit. Because as we develop and grow in our understanding of the Lord, and read the book of Esther, we see his fingerprint all over it. And so I just was wrestling with that as I was preparing the lesson. And, you know, people say this all the time. You know, God's not mentioned in the book of Esther. Yes, he is. It just isn't in ways that we see him speaking in other books. And so that is one of the first kind of, I want to say fallacies that I want to deal with in this particular scripture. There are a couple of others that we're going to deal with as well. Maybe not fallacies, maybe things that are open to interpretation. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, we just bless you. We ask you to be with us, Father God. We ask you to help us, Lord. Touch our hearts, Father and give them, make them a good soil for your word. Father God, we pray that you would show us things in the word that we have never seen before. Father, we thank you that we know that you are always present, that you are always speaking, and that you are always um, caring for your creation. Lord, I pray that as we study this book, that it would provide a tremendous comfort to each and every one of us in 2024 as we watch your hand, Father God, working all things together, well, working all things together for those who love you, for the good of those who love you, according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. So as per my normal, not a whole lot of changes, but I did change the title of this lesson. And I feel like I just had to do it. Because the Sunday School book has entitled the lesson, hold on, let me tell you what they, what they call it. God in the Shadows. And I changed the Sunday school lesson to God is Sovereign. <laughs> because sometimes we don't realize how these subtle descriptions or these subtle characterizations of the Lord, how they impact how we understand who he is, his power, his sovereignty, his ways. And so this is one of Many things we have to be careful about. Let me give you another example. You know, I don't watch horror movies because, number one, I, I have an active enough imagination that I don't need any help. <laughs> but even with that, back in, you know, 100 years ago when I did watch a horror movie, I was always taken aback at how weak the priest looked. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's this dark force, and the priest looks, ah, what? <laughs> That's not what we see in the New Testament church. That's not the power of the word of God. That's not the authority that the Lord has given us. 
And so I know that the world loves its own and creates things to, you know, exalt the God of this age. However, we have to be careful about how we allow these things to influence how we see the Lord. And so I never think about the Lord as being in the shadow or working in the shadow. I always think of the Lord as being in complete control. And that is why, at step one, I decided to change the lesson, the title of the lesson. Let's begin reading. It says, the story of Esther often ranks among our favorites. And I'm reading at the top of the Sunday school lesson. Um, from the Old Testament, told and retold in Sunday school from our youngest age. Esther is a grand piece of literature, a beautiful, captivating story filled with all the elements that draw us in, keep us reading, and make a lasting impression on our hearts and minds. There is no better story than the overarching narrative of God's activity in this world. It is within this grander story that the story of God's redeeming and restoring work in this world that, wait, there, wait. (laughs) It is within that grander story that the story of God's redeeming and restoring work in this world that the story of Esther, Mordecai, and their people, God's people, can rightly be understood, experienced, and then passed on in various contexts and of time and place. This is a story about God and how God works in this world to fulfill his purposes. We meet in the pages of Esther, a God who is eternally loyal to his covenant promises and his covenant people, gracious to them despite their past choices of disobedience and ever present in his efforts to bring them and those around them into lives of relief and deliverance. And so let's take a step back. When we we say that God is um, ever faithful to his people despite their past choices of disobedience, let's put the book of Esther in the context. Where does the book of Esther fall in terms of the history of the Jewish people? Persia. They are in Persia. How did they get there? On <laughs> foot. <laughs> By way of Babylon. <laughs> right? They, they were not driving a fast car. We know that for sure. But this, but but where it falls, this particular account is important because it takes place after the captivity, which we know they were taken into captivity right. because of disobedience as a act of judgment by the Lord. And so now they find themselves, you know, those who have not returned, right? So there are a group of people we know went back, and there are some who went back to do other things, and, and some remained. And now there are some in Persia, which is now, from what the Sunday School book tells us, modern-day Iran yep. in the southwest corner. And though they stayed, when they could have gone back, go back home, right? Um, the Lord is still taking care of, watching over guarding and protecting them. Not in the shadows, but quite actively. For my own Bible, the background and the date, it says that the book takes its name from a beautiful orphan Jewess who became the queen of the Persian king uh, Xerxes, although he does have a Hebrew name. And I actually looked up how to pronounce his name. (laughs) And then at the bottom of the Sunday school lesson, I put a little site here so that you all can also go and learn how to pronounce these names, right? So we don't have to say, I don't want to read today. (laughs) 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 
So based on the pronunciation, this is the Hebrew version of Xerxes. And there are two different ways that one can pronounce this. As a Xerxes, Xerxes, as a Xerxes, or as a, 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 a website, as a Eris. Ahasuerus. Two, two different ways. But we're going to stick with Xerxes. And who knew? Right. Who, who, who knew that the X um, name would be the easiest one to pronounce? Anyway, it says he is generally believed to be King Xerxes I, who succeeded Darius I in 485 BC and ruled for 20 years over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. This is important because some of this um, diversity becomes important to how we understand what is going on. He lived in the capital, in the Persian capital of Shushan. At this time, a number of Jews were still in Babylon under Persian rule, even though they had been free to return to Jerusalem for over 50 years. The story takes place, or this account in Esther, takes place over a period of four years, starting in the third reign, third year of Xerxes' reign. And so I broke the Sunday school up into two different parts, and we're going to look at maybe a little bit more in chapter 1 than what they asked for, so you're going to need your Bible out, and then we'll look at a little bit in chapter 2. So can someone read Esther verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 7 through 22? This is what happened during the time of Xerxes, the Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, and in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media. The princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, the human, Bistha, Harbana, Biktha, Abaktha, Zether, and Carcass. I could have used that website. Right? <laughs> <laughs> to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Okay. Karshena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Mares, Marsena, and Memukun the seven nobles of Persia and Media, who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Memucan replied, 
in the presence of the king and the nobles. Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, <laughs> King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. <clears throat> this very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. Oh, my goodness. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household, using his native tongue. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, so let's uh, start to unpackage this. And we're also going to be relying on the commentary in our Bibles if we have, you know, good commentary. And so we're going to begin with question number one. And in question number one, it says, what grand events, there are a lot of things going on in verses one through nine, but what grand events are taking place in verses one through nine? Okay, there's some banquets and some feasts, right? There are at least three grand, maybe on different scales, things that are taking place in verses 1 through 9. First of all, you have the king himself with his grand feast, which lasts how long? 180 days. That's a lot of food. Ooh, six months. Then you also have a secondary, you know, feast that takes place for seven days after that, you know, as if six months is not enough. But then you also have, in verse 9, something taking place. She's having her own feast and celebration for the women. Okay? Great. So why do you think these things are taking place? Why, why would a king have a celebration for six months? Show his power and authority. And his wealth. <coughs> to show his wealth, to show his stature. Somebody said because he can. <laughs> I love that. Because he can. Because we can't have a party for you for six months. With the food in our house right now, we could probably do about two weeks. Right? <laughs> Most of it will be canned okay. and warming it up. However, there was a desire on his part to, after having conquered these vast lands from India to Ethiopia, to demonstrate, here's who I am. It's not very different than others who want to display wealth in different ways in 2024. Yes, Ed. My commentary says that the persons in attendance and the length of the meeting suggest the purpose may have been to plan for a campaign from 482 to 479 against Greece. Against Greece. So we do know that he is a conquering king, which means he goes out and he brings others into his um, uh, uh, realm. But there, there is a level of buttering up, even if that is the case. There is a level of buttering up that's going on, and a display of power, a display of wealth, a display of, hey, if you partner with me, don't worry. If I can spend this much on a feast for 180 days, and then for seven, and I can also allow my 
queen to have her own peace, surely I will have enough resources to keep you and your people um, engaged in war. Although I do have to say to the commentary that if it was to plan a campaign, no wonder they lost to Greece. Because they were all drunk. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's take a, a step back. So we have a sense that it was taking place, so there is a, a sense of authority, a sense of wealth that's being displayed, but what might it have represented to the guests? So we well, talked about power on, if you were invited, maybe some, you felt like you're an important person that got invited to this feast. I love that. Yeah. Right? And so it also, to the guests, it says, because who's on the guest list? That's what people always want to know, right? <laughs> Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Who's been invited? You know, what, what is their stature? So there's also this kind of, you know, maybe hearkening back to that, or even if that's not the case, this connectivity that is being demonstrated. This is important because there are a few things about the way this administration is being run that I want to highlight. In a minute. I would have equated it to High Council in the Salvation Army. <laughs> you bring all the leaders together for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Minus the wine. Yeah. 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 Minus the wine. Can I? Can I? Yes. Too? Absolutely. The difference in some is that you're going toward evidently when you call it connectivity, I would call it spree decor. Okay. And so, I would not equate it to the High Council. I would equate it to commissioning. I mean, if you want people to. Oh wave flags, wear uniforms, yeah. sing war songs, you better gather them every once in a while to rehearse this mm -hmm. pra practice mm -hmm. uh, in, in order to re refresh and to sustain it. And mm -hmm. if you don't do that, the, the identity of the community is lost. Mm -hmm. the International Congress. So yeah. one of the things I liked that the you just between said... between that and the High Council is... Well, maybe that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> The people of the High Council, well, I guess they're, they're not gathered there to depose the sitting general. It's because the general has reached the end of his term. Mm -hmm. So, for us non -grew, grew up in Salvation Army people, let's take it outside of the Salvation Army. That's me. I didn't grow up in the Salvation Army. And let's, let's put it in back into Persia for a moment. Because there are these touch points for them to come is also to say something about how they view themselves in this broader kingdom. Let me say that again. For the people to actually show up and participate, it also says something about how they view themselves within this broader context. Because there could be those who say, no, we, Persia, we don't even like you. We're not coming. We don't agree with what you're doing. There is some kind of shaking of the hand whether it is because they want to, or because they feel forced to, or because they just want to remain in his good graces, whatever it is, there is a dual touch point going on here. Yes? My commentary said that um, Xerxes was trying to win their loyalty mm -hmm. for a future battle with the Greeks. Absolutely. So that concurs, and that loyalty is demonstrated by showing up in some ways, whether it is a loyalty that is forced or a loyalty that is, you know, uh, because you just want to give it. All right, good. Let's keep going. Either way, it's a meeting of the minds with a whole lot of money flowing. In question number two, what do we learn about the, let's say, the rules of engagement? Let's, let's go back to verse... Eight, the rules of engagement. And I want us to look at this in comparison and contrast to other things that we have studied, and quite recently, to be honest with you, in terms of required behaviors by kings in public settings. So in verse 8, it says, In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. For, the king, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they may do according to each man's pleasure. Give them what they want. 
Oh, getting what they want. They're from a lot of different places, and so their customs may have varied from his. So they were able to do the way they were accustomed to. Ah. Building coalition. Oh. <coughs> now let's do some compare and contrast, Nebuchadnezzar. Let's do some compare and contrast of other empires and other kingdoms where when we conquer, rule, or bring you under our fold, we're really not asking for your culture. We're asking for assimilation. And it's nice that you have your own customs, and it's nice that you have your own culture. However, we have new names for you. And when we, you know, sound the horn, you are to bow to the statue. You are to adopt our baby G, non-existent God. You are to uh, do what we say do. Now, this is important because there is a level of... What do I want to call it? Colonialism. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Minus some of the maybe more forced assimilation. Because even in some colonialism, you do see this kind of impos imposition of, you know, we want you speaking this way, doing this, being more like us. As opposed to, oh, you can still be you. Just know that we're all in this kind of uh, affiliation together. Is that just to show their power over the other people? You know what? To make them do what they, you know, live their lifestyle. Yeah. I think that that is an excellent question. It, it really says something about an approach to ruling. Because there are lots of different ways we can choose to rule, right? We can choose to rule by forcing assimilation. And if you don't assimilate, then you're eliminated. Or if you don't assimilate, then you... Uh, and that's one way to get loyalty, right? Because if you don't bow, we kill you. So the only ones that are left are the loyal ones. We just looked at this in the book of Daniel. Right? That's what I'm saying. Let's do some comparison and contrast. And that's not to say that the Babylonian Empire was doing that across the board. I just want to show the compare and contrast. Because even something as simple as do you have to engage in this, you know, beverage, adult beverage, you know, he's saying you can do this according to your own custom. You can do this according to your own will. It can give you the sense of freedom. It can give you a sense of freedom, which could make you feel like being a, a skosh more loyal. But it's just a way of ruling. They're still under his thumb. <laughs> well, it, I'm it's, curious. It's, it's like today where people... In, invite you in, basically tempt you to ascend, but they do it slowly <laughs> yes. to get you into their fault. Yeah, it, absolutely. And as we know, it can, it can change at any given point, right? right. Mm -hmm. You can have a Egypt where Joseph is respected, where Joseph is um, second in command, mm -hmm. and then a new pharaoh shows up and all of a sudden you and all your family are the new slaves. So these things can change. Yes, what do you want to say, Ed? His father was Darius the Great. Okay. So you would think that precedent has been set by Darius the Great, the wife and son, altering mm -hmm. the rules of engagement. Yes. Does he think that his father's rules were not effective enough, and he's changing it because he has a different tactic? Obviously, if he's about to go to war, he wants to make sure that people are with him, and he's trying to build coalition, I think, mm -hmm. at some level. But interesting that he wouldn't just follow wise father. Right. And so the other thing that we want to, because we see two or three references to this, this isn't just for today. This concept of being able to understand who you are in your own cultural context, we see that also in verse 22. Right? And so in verse 22, they don't send it out in their language. And force, it's a language and food. 
are some of these kind of core things. So let's say all of a sudden I decided this is me being wicked. Okay, in, in Sunday school, we're going to do the class in Pig Latin. Right? And that's the only way I'm going to speak in this class. And so if you want to participate, this is the language that we're going to use. You all might say, I don't care that you used to play this with your boys and speak to them in Pig Latin. You don't get to tell us what language we're going to use. We'll use our own language. Right? It's a kind of, that's a kind of forced assimilation around language. That's core to who we are. What we speak and what we eat. And so the fact that in verse 22 we also see this going out, this edict that we're going to talk about in a moment in every man's language so he would understand in his own words that says something about how this particular um, what shall we call it? Empire. Empire. Empire, that's fine, is being ruled. 127 provinces, it's phenomenal. It's yes. the largest thing on earth. Right, and, and if you really want to get quick unity, forced unity, you force your language on people. Mm -hmm. If you really want to get quick and forced unity, you force your culture on them. And then those who don't like it can be eliminated or so subjugated that they really, you know, will, will wish they had just agreed to do it. And that's another way that people have ruled. I mean, um, you go back to, like, ancient China, China today. I mean, you, you go back and you look at many of these empires, this is how things were done. Okay, let's keep going. I just want to show the contrast and the comparison because there is something going on here. What I'd like you all to juxtapose in your mind is where it looks like there's some, I don't want to call it looseness, but some, some degrees of freedom versus where it looks like there's some iron fist. There looks like there's some degrees of freedom, right? You drink if you want, you don't drink if you don't want, and then there's some iron fist going on at the same time. Do you think that maybe he said you can drink whatever you want, when you want, just to see what the reaction of the people would be? No, I, you know, I kind of, I kind of um, agree with some of what's already been said, which is he is reaffirming alliances. And in that reaffirming of alliances, his leadership style is to make you want to be in alliance with him as opposed to feel like you're forced to be in alliance with him. And so by allowing those degrees of freedom where, well, if your culture says you only drink one cup of wine, and you know, you don't have to get as drunk as I do, and everyone doesn't have to do what I'm doing, because that typically would be what happens with the king. You do what the king is doing. And so if the king is having a cup, raise your glass. If I don't, I say raise your glass, and you decide you don't want to drink anymore, then, you know, off with your head, right? So he's allowing for some of that kind of independence. Yes. But it's also manipulation. Absolutely. That's what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we said he's buttering these people up at some level. Mm -hmm. at, at some level. He's working the crowd. <laughs> <clears throat> but let's keep going. What do we learn about the king in verse 10? He's feeling really good now. <laughs> and he summons for the queen. He's drunk. Yeah. He's, drunk. Yeah. He's drunk. Right. He's drunk. And so um, I, it says, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. You know, I, I don't really get the sense that it's like I'm just a little inebriated. He's probably pretty good and drunk. Maybe functioning still, like not like under the table or under the carpet or whatever. <laughs> but he is, he's not in his right mind. Right? And so now that he is no longer in his right mind, functioning at his full faculties, he is doing what people do when they get drunk. He's, you know, 
Right. He's, he, he's getting ready to, to start do, doing some poor decision making. But he, yeah. but he is still the king. Yeah. He is. Even in his drunken state. Absolutely. He is still the king. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> All right. So in verse 10, his heart is filled with wine and he commands his eunuchs to do what? What is the next and new element he wants to introduce to the celebration? It's the queen. Bring, the queen. Bring in the queen. Bring in the queen. Now let, let, let's put this in some context. And, and again, I'm going to go with a fallacy. And this, I've never heard it here, but I have certainly been in churches and heard sermons where Vashti is, I'm just going to say, as demonized as Jezebel. Oh, I've heard it. For, you know, her arrogance, her pride, her whatever, in terms of not obeying the order of the king. I've, I've heard it. Maybe. Out from one verse. I said, I've heard sermons, yes. and I've heard, not in this church, but I've heard her demonized in right. other, you know, parts of Christendom for not, for her arrogance, for her whatever, for her willfulness, for not obeying the king. And it wasn't until... I want to say she was the bishop of the a &E church, and her name was Vashti. It wasn't until I saw this woman with this name coming from a biblical family, coming, you know, in a, in a, in a, a, a real, you know, love the Lord. Bishop in the AME Church. I think she's the bishop. It made me think to myself because nobody would name their their children Nero, <laughs> right? We don't name our child Judas. It, right. It gave me pause. It just gave me pause to go back and say, "What's going on here?" Right? We don't repeat names of people who we think are truly wicked. And so I just want to hit that pause for a moment, and I want us to maybe begin to challenge. Maybe you've never heard it, but I promise you I could cough up five sermons right now that would be, you know, demonizing her for being so... Principled. <laughs> full, full, let's say full of herself, not obeying the king. Yeah, yes, Ellen. I want to read my commentary. Sure. It says she may have anticipated an unpleasant and awkward situation. Here's another one. According to Jewish historians, Vashti was to appear wearing only mm -hmm. her crown. Right. Right. The prospect of being ogled by a drunken crowd, regardless of what she was to wear, could explain her refusal. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Only her crown. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, according to Chris, yes. Commentary. Yes. According to Clark's commentary, um, being called to that kind of setting, she was Persian. She was a Persian woman. Mm -hmm. And that was contrary to the usage of any Persian woman, mm -hmm. let alone a queen. Mm -hmm. And so um, it would have been considered very indecent and unbecoming to the modesty of a lady as well as to the dignity of her station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's go back to what Commissioner said, and yet he's still the king. Yeah. Right? But he was doing and she is what still was the and, she, and she is still the well, queen. For but, but, time she will be. But, but he is, <laughs> for, for where we are right now, this is the king. The king has sent this order. But, but why is he doing this? He's drunk. Yeah. Well, he's, he's drunk, he's, he's, but, but yeah. what, what else is going on here? What else could be going on here? Yes. I, I don't know. At any rate, um, she had just given birth, and any woman that knows that you've just given birth, just you're not birth. in your best. <laughs> and that might have been why she didn't want to go, because she was so beautiful, and she was known as beautiful, and she's probably not, I mean, there's... 
not that she wasn't still beautiful, but she felt probably that she wasn't as beautiful as she should be. So, Did your commentary say she just gave birth? Yeah. I don't know. She's giving her own banquet. Okay, well, wait. So we'll, we'll pause on that. Al? He wanted her to come there to show off another one of his possessions yeah. to be this is, you know, I'm, I'm this yeah. Is he Persian? Look. Is he yes, Persian? he is yes. Persian. So he would know some of what's been, but he's not in his right mind. We already said he's drunk. Right? She was lovely to look at. Okay. So I, it says Queen Vashti was deposed at about the same time that she gave birth to a son, Ar Okay. Okay. Yeah. Although her insubordination infuriated the king and cost her the kingdom, Vashti seems to have regained some of, of her influence when her son, whatever his name is, mm -hmm. ascended the throne. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, okay, that's all. But, but, but the point is, and I want to read a couple of things in the commentary that... that the Sunday School book provided. Here is a king. See, we don't even know what that concept is. We don't understand the concept of a king. Because we don't live in a place, in a land where you do what you're told. We, we, under, we have a sense of freedom, right? And so we don't have a sense that there's anybody who really can make us do anything and if you disobey that person it is at your own peril up to and including immediate death All right. if we understood this you know as a lived experience it would put her choices into a better context but even though we can't understand i still want us to put ourselves in that situation because this is a real act of courage, defiance, call it what you will. It could cost right, it could cost her her life because as we've said, you can be drunk, you can be insane, you can be immoral, but when the king speaks, you obey the king. And so I want to talk about a little bit of what the commentary says, and we're moving into question number four. It says, what is the, king's res the queen's response to his command, and what risk, what does she risk with her chosen response? Okay, so let's, let's just talk about it. I'm going to read two different um, commentaries. The first one is, is from, not the book, but from the, the, I guess, the commentary for the Sunday School book. It says, while the reason for the king's request seems obvious, and, and so they say that his reason for request is, look what I got. I just showed you all my wealth. I've just given you all of this. Look at me. Look how powerful I am. Look at all that I have. And on top of all that, I have this beautiful woman too. Let me bring her on out so you can see. I have the most gorgeous woman in all the land, even above all of your queens and, and concubines, etc. Okay? You have to keep in mind that women were possessions back then. It says, some early Jewish interpreters suggested that the command to appear wearing her royal crown meant wearing only her crown and nothing else. So, if so, her refusal reveals her modesty. Josephus, who we have heard his name before, um, a, a first century A.D. Jewish historian, mentioned that a Persian law mentions a Persian law that would not allow her to be seen by strangers. Right? So, so right now we're starting to violate an actual law, keep the word actual, when we get to later on. Ironically, then Vashti was refusing to break a law at the king's command, though the king declared Persian law was unbreakable. 
Let me read the next commentary, which I think goes a little deeper. This one says, the narrative begins with Queen Vashti's deliberate and defiant refusal to obey her husband, King Xerxes. His request for her to appear before the noblemen was a means of objectification and control. After all, he had just finished showing off all his other possessions. And in accordance with his patriarchal culture, Vashti was also his property to flaunt. According to Persian custom, women could be present at banquets before the drinking began. At Belshazzar's banquet, only women from the king's harem were present. Let me say that again. Only women from the harem were present. This is the queen we're talking about. The summoning Vashti not only diminished her role as the king's property, but further denigrated her status by presenting her as a mere concubine. And so it says Vashti's refusal challenged Xerxes in two ways. First, it usurped the power he wielded as king. But secondly, it also challenged her culture's familial power a husband had over his wife. And it says, for this reason, Vashti's defiance was viewed as a threat to all the men in the entire kingdom. So th there's a lot going on here. <laughs> a lot. And I'm, wondering if we're, I'm wondering if we're citing, citing prematurely and citing correctly uh, in, in some of our assumptions made here. I mean, could this not be the his, this could this not be the victory lap for um, equality in the church uh, from the Salvation Army perspective? Wow! Wow! So I will, we're not fighting at all. First of all, let's, let's start with that, right? We, we are we are simply unpacking. And I started by saying I feel like there are a few fallacies. One of the fallacies is that God is not. And mentioned in in Job, in that Job, Lord, not mentioned in Esther, where, in my opinion, God's fingerprints are all over this, right? And just because He's not saying "Thus saith the Lord" doesn't mean the Lord is not all over this book. You should. You, we need to be able to recognize the Lord's thumbprint on situations. Second thing I said was, and I have heard it, Vashti being demonized on the level of Jezebel for being so arrogant, for being, you know, for not submitting to her husband. I've heard it. And so we're just unpacking what else could be going on here. I don't know if it's a banner to be raised as much as it is a, we got to ask ourselves the question and not just look at these things on the surface. Here is a drunken man. We're about to get something else good. Here is a drunken man who happens to be the king and has the ability to kill you if you don't obey him. Asking her to violate and, you know, uh, humiliate herself publicly. And she chew and, and possibly even be put to death. She chooses to not obey. But that obedience to husband... Sounds like it's somewhere close to obedience to king. And so she's pushing two envelopes at the same time. She's in a lose-lose position. You know she what? Win. At that time, and even today, in many places, women are, can be in a no-win situation. A, a no-win. Well, he's, he's inviting, he's not inviting, he's commanding her to come in. Knowing he and his wise men, who all men, mm -hmm. knew that this was unprecedented yes. for Persian women. Right. Right? So now when he's sober, how would he look at her if she had come in? Right. Absolutely. You Absolutely. Know? So she's in a lose lose. Yes. She can't, it short, matter. short term. Because yeah. when her son becomes king, she is restored as queen mother to his right. status. So. But it, she still, she didn't know that then. whatever choice she made <clears throat> would have been the wrong choice yes. as far as the king was concerned. Right. But, but can king, I just, The king not yeah. only has the ability, he has the right to uh, do what 
we think he's going to do. <laughs> right. He is the king. Right. Can, can I just go back and say one other thing? I renamed the lesson, God is Sovereign. It's the gateway for Esther. Right. <laughs> because the Lord is also, you know... He's got something to do with it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. The I didn't Lord, mean it got loud. He is, and He does, and the Lord's hand is in this. And so we may not always realize you know, the Lord's hand at work in our lives as we are going through it. But when we get on the other side of a particular situation and look back and reflect, Amen. we can see Amen. it was the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. And as a kind of almost grace, thank God she wasn't killed. <clears throat> and thank God she eventually is restored. It's almost like Hagar, the Lord, saying, oh, I'm not going to kill you just because Abraham and Sarah got you caught up in their plot. I'm going to save you. I'm going to save your son. We're going to send you off somewhere else. And we're going to keep it moving with this child of promise. The Lord sees us. The Lord sees us. Absolutely. And he is sovereign. And he is making... And these things are being done in accordance to his will. Okay, let's keep going. So it says, what did the king do in verse 13? So, okay, no, let's go to, to verse 12 first. So she refused to come for whatever reason. Now we know, hopefully, that it wasn't just her arrogance, you know, her pride. She's not a submissive wife, whatever. She might have had a reason to say no. She did have several reasons to say no. Excellent reasons. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we never want to, I, I promise you I could cough one up for next week, listen to a sermon about how wicked Vashti was. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but then it says that the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Yeah. And so it says, you know, what does he do in verse 13? So now let's look at this. So in verse 13, he chooses his wise men who understood the times. And my commentary says these wise men are men skilled in the law. And the plot thickens. Because this means that these men who are skilled in the law would have known these laws around when does a queen present herself, when does a queen not present herself. You know, this is more like a concubine. This is more like a queen, the way you treat your queen. So these men would have had some sense because they're skilled in the law. They're drunk too. <laughs> yes, he must have known he was not doing it right because he right. had to call his lawyers. Yeah. I mean, if he were the king, he could have and right. could have just said kill her. So he knew in the back of his mind, uh oh, I got myself in a pickle. What, well, here. well, let's think about it. what what's the pickle he's in, right? Well, it's, he ordered to do something against the law. He and ordered. He's Right. He's embarrassed. Absolutely. So let's take these things, three, these three comments together. Number one, he may have broken some Persian law about when queens and wives and whatnot present. So he broke a law, and I gotta, you know, what change from the Catholic Church to the Episcopal Church, right? I broke the law. Yeah. It happens. It does. <laughs> and then we also have him aghast and ashamed that I sent this command. And, and is she what? She didn't obey me? Let alone she's the queen. She's my wife. She's my property. And she's not obeying me. And I'm the king over this great, you know, empire. And I can't even get this, this woman. This mere woman. I'm just saying. This woman to obey me. That, that doesn't look good if you're the king. Again, we're not talking about 2024. We have 
go all the way back to a patriarchal society, or we could go in 2024 to places where women can't even, aren't even allowed to speak out loud anymore, aren't even allowed to speak or sing out loud anymore in 2024 today. Yes, Roberta. Well, uh, my commentary says, um, let's see here. Cersei, uh, no. He, he invited important officials from all over his land to see his power, wealth, and authority. It was perceived he had no authority over his own wife. His military credibility would have been damaged. That's exactly right. the point we're making. Yes, I Do you am. think maybe that's yeah. why she wasn't killed and just to dispose because he knew he was wrong mm -hmm. and that was a, a way out? To, to you know, dispose her rather than, than kill her. So if I had to give my answer, I would say something the Lord just said to me three days ago. Grace is always on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Three days ago, the Lord said to me, Grace is always on the menu. And so again, in his sovereignty and in his love for his creation, the Lord kept her from being immediately killed. Okay, let's keep going. And so it says, he's talking to these people in verse 15. I just want us to look in this. Is there anything unusual about their answer in verse 15? Because he says, what shall we do to Queen, what shall we do to Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she did not obey the command of King Xerxes brought to her by the eunuchs. And then it goes on to, to, to ask some other things. What is their answer? Is there anything surprising about this? Because what did he ask them? Now all the women in the country will... Uh... <laughs> so, so now we're supposing and we're saying, but what did he ask them? According to the law. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what letter, what bill, what legislative <laughs> act, what law did they cite? They didn't. No. Who no. said it? They didn't. No. <laughs> They didn't. they didn't. Because he said, what shall we do according to the law? Amen. And there was either none that they could think of, although they are skilled in the law, or they chose not to reference a law. Right. And now we see some agenda going on. Well, suddenly he wants to do things that are lawful when he's already done something that is non-lawful. Right. And then he brings his expert in, but this is, this is what I want us to hear. He said, what shall we do according to the law? After, Make a new one. After Make, <laughs> that's what I want us to hear. Yeah. Right. right. We're going to make a new one. We're going to make a new one. The king can do that. We're <laughs> going to make a new one. Because maybe the law was silent. Maybe they didn't bring it up. But the point is we have now shifted into agenda. We are not operating according to the law right now. Or the law is silent. Because they are now going to use this as an opportunity to use some agenda. Because as we read later, it says that they have him to issue a decree. Make a new one. So that's what I wrote on my own notes. It says no law or they were silent on the law and they made up one. And then they fed it to him, and he then created this law. Mm -hmm. But if he's, he's asking these people, what shall we do? He was the king. Yeah. He's deflecting his guilt. Well, well he may not know. I, I, kind of, I kind of look at them as the parliamentarians. The parliamentarians are those in, a, like in an assembly who are supposed to have some sense of governance. They should know something about the Constitution, the bylaws, and Robert's Rules of Order, right? And so 
these would be the people who would, or like the scribes in the New Testament, or even in the Old Testament, I suppose they were called scribes. People who know the law, study the law, and are able to answer. So they either were A, silent on what they knew, or B, working on some other agenda. Either way, it's terrible. So he was not a dictator. He was willing to fall into the law. Well, when it... He was Work. taking the onus off his own shoulders, yes. putting it on the shoulders of these lawyers. Yeah. But okay. as a dictator, he could have said this yeah, what he wanted to do. Right. right. That's true. So, so let's keep going and then we'll stop. We will get to chapters two, chapter two, and we'll integrate that into next week. I'm not even sure where, that, where that's going, maybe chapter three, but we'll just bring that back. Um, they encourage him in verse 19 to send out a decree that will remind, oh, for all, for all, you know, <laughs> sense, sake and purpose, all women that they have to obey their husbands. They don't want to see chaos. And if they hear that the queen has been disobedient, then that could lead to chaos. So in other words, let's clamp down and get more control. Uh, I'm women. Right, of the women. <laughs> let's, let's clamp down and let's get a little more control. Okay? And then... Again, this idea of degrees of freedom versus iron fist. It says they had him to make a decree. They proclaimed it throughout the whole empire. All wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And then he had them to send the letters to the provinces, each province in its own script and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. And you know what is so interesting to me? There's this idea, concept of submission in the New Testament too, right? Mm -hmm. But it says that the husband should be following Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's right. and, and here, there, obviously there's no mention of Christ per se, but it's like, let's just clamp down. But once we get to the New Testament, this idea of submission also brings in it, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Yeah. And that's not a controlling love. Sacrificial. That's a sacrificial love. I wonder how the queen felt when she was told there was a woman better than she was in the kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> You know what, I, I would say this, which is so interesting, and the fact that her son restored her. When it comes to certain decisions, I would rather be by myself and alone mm -hmm. and know I'm standing on the side of Christ mm -hmm. than to be in the crowd with everybody else. And they say, well, she, they're better than you because they decided to do thus and so and you're over there. I'd rather stand by myself with the Lord than to stand in the crowd with others. <coughs> and so if it were me, I'm not Vashti, but if I made a decision based on um, a principal decision, and my principal decisions will involve Christ. And they say, well, get her out of here. There's a better Sunday school teacher than her. I would say, well, then take her. Or take him. Yeah. Because I'm going to be with Jesus on this one. Amen. <laughs> and you all get pull out the pitchforks and the torches, as well, far as I'm concerned. One day she's the queen, the next day she's told there's somebody better than she Hey, they're, they're in, the, in, the, in accordance to this world, there will always be. The world loves its own. There will always be. We cannot allow how others characterize us to cause us to compromise our witness. All right. Let's um, close with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Father God, for the strength and the courage that you give us to stand up in this dark and dying world, Lord, and to stand with you. Father, we ask that as we continue to think about um, this lesson, that you will reveal to us even how you are operating in our lives, Father God, in places where it may seem that you are being quiet. Mm. Lord, illuminate those places for us that we may praise you today for something that you did in our past. Or we may be comforted because we now can see your hand in our lives at work today. Yeah. We'll be sure to give you all of the glory 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.